Classes in Game Design, based on the books by George Phillies and Tom Vasil. Design Elements of Contemporary Strategy Games and Contemporary Perspectives in Game Design, both from Third Millennium Publications, HTTP 3mpub.com slash fillies. And today, this lecture is Detail in Games, Coarse and Fine Graining. In any event, what I am going to do today is to discuss coarse graining, and I'm going to discuss economics. We've discussed bits of these already. What I want to emphasize is how you can put in more or less detail into a game which either make the game better or worse. So having said that, let us consider a bit about economics that we haven't talked about before. And a bit about bits about economics, since I've said a fair amount about levels, and you have now played Vanished Planet, which has four level economics. Well, first of all, there are choices in how many levels of economics you have. Uh, you start out with raw materials or whatever, and you go up and complexify them one level at a time, as you saw on Vanished Planet, and at some point you end up with something that gives you victory points, or it gives you a step up the tech tree, or it gives you um, more production or research facilities or whatever. And the number of levels you put in it can look impressive, but each time you add a level, the number of things the players have to think about go up appreciably. Now, there are players who much enjoy doing this. For example, there are people who will have picked up a copy of Vanished Planet, and the first thing they will have done is to calculate exactly which resources and how many they need to collect in order to see if they can build a mine every turn using their own resources, since this will ensure that the creature never eats them. And they'll just do this automatically before they start playing the game, because there is, here is this object that is going to knock you out, and here is the perfect defense against it. Uh, the equivalent to this in the old game, Stellar Conquest, this was a serious design flaw of the game, in my opinion, uh, was the planetary force field. You landed, you developed planets, you built spaceships, warships, a space warfare game. Uh, however, this, there was this object, the planetary force screen, which meant that your planet could never be attacked successfully, could never be bombarded, uh, could never be knocked out economically. In other words, <clears throat> planets with planetary force screens were indestructible. This was a serious disadvantage in a competitive game because everyone would go after getting them, and after a while, things would automatically come to a stop because there was nothing that could be fought over. Um, there's also, now I've mentioned development. Let us consider development. And the development I am going to mention, there's this notion we have a technology tree, but that's something of an illusion. Consider, I will go back in my own family. My grandmother was the first woman in the Austro-Hungarian Empire to be a telegraph operator. And a telegraph Yeah, you hit the key, and it sends data. It's a digital transmission data, and it gets up to about one to three baud, meaning you're sending a bit every so often at a speed the ear can keep up with, because after all, you have to listen to it to be able to write down the messages. And then there were technology improvements. There was the coherer a device that escaped from a Victorian Rube Goldberg lab. There was the vacuum tube. And at the same time there were the vacuum tube, there were also relays as a way of driving telephone systems. And then we come along and there were transistors. And transistors, you could easily push up to higher frequencies, well not easily, but you could push up to higher frequencies than you could easily get vacuum tubes to work at. And someone eventually chugs along and we have chips. And at some point in here we have optical things. Um, 
I have seen optical computers and they're kind of competitive with my Brainiac K30 in terms of how much land area you need to do a calculation. You have this big table and it's maybe incredibly fast, but it's not, there's, it's a shift register. Um, but there's, there's hope for progress. People want to put lasers on ships. And then of course, we get up to big chips and we have advanced, if we're talking about computers from things that are clocked at many kilohertz to things that are clocked at megahertz and finally we have parallel processors and multiple cores and we get up to gigahertz, and I am reminded that only a few years ago one of my students remarked that she had a computer, it was really top line game computer, it was very fast. For $14,000 you got the liquid nitrogen cooling of the main CPU, which does allow you to drive up the speed considerably. On the other hand, the machine I'm considering buying at a slightly more than 10% of the cost actually goes up to the teraflop, and that's about how, and it will look just like any other desktop, except it would be a bit faster. And you notice there's this enormous increase in not only how fast you can shove data around, but what you can do with it. I mean, with these things, you can build a, a machine that will play tic-tac-toe reliably. I've played against one. And down here you get things that are much more impressive. Um, however, if you are looking at this tech tree thing, you notice that you, in many games you sort of have to march in ironclad lockstep through the tech tree. Under modern conditions, if you were the dictator of some small ninth world country and you decided to introduce the electrical revolution, starting with all of your subjects who had never seen a light bulb, um, this actually exists in some parts of the world still. Um, you probably would not start with telegraph lines. You would skip steps and you would start technology here. And if you somehow persuaded some Intel competitor that they were going to get so much graft back that they should build a factory in your company and they fell for this line, you would not start by building transistors, you'd be doing the equivalent of an Intel CPU plant. Now there are good countries with sensible governments that have actually done this and if you look at your um, computer cores and ask you what countries these were made in, it's countries you wouldn't think of as being high tech, but that's where they started. That's not where they finished, that's where they started pretty much. The message is, there is this notion you have a tech tree, however, if you aren't the people at the leading edge technologically, you don't have to march through all of the previous steps to get into the modern world. And the successful countries, some of them, have done exactly that. Singapore, for example, a country that is as well to do with many parts of Europe, and better to do than some parts of the United States did not go through all of these things. They started in a sensible manner. Okay, that's one piece of, te of technology and economics that doesn't get talked about a lot. There's another piece though, and the other piece which shows up in the semi-military with economics games is the prevalence of Soviet command economics. That is, you go out, you find raw materials, you may have to ship them home, you build shipyards, you build refining plants, you build industrial plants, and you, everything happens basically because you say so. And the fact that your um, space fleet is chewing up large parts of gross national product has no other effects. Now, we actually saw an example of this dropped dead about the time you folks were born. It was called the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union had a stock of nuclear weapons larger than ours. 
It had a military which in many respects was the most powerful in the world. And it did this all on the gross national product of Canada. The way it did this was that it spent 50 or 70 percent of GNP on military forces, none of which ever accomplished much positive. Yes, the glorious Soviet army did put down the Hungarian Revolution. It did take over Czechoslovakia a second time. Uh, it did invade Afghanistan, a losing proposition for everyone historically who's ever tried it. Uh, we're still trying. Um, but in term, and in, when the Germans showed up, it was effective. However, in 1975, 1980, it became painfully obvious that so much of the economy had gone into tanks and aircraft, they didn't have a scientific industry, instrument industry. Soviet theorists who were doing paper and pencil work were very good. But the computer industry was way, way back. Uh, the scientific in instrument industry, small scientific instruments that you use in biotech, did not exist. And the net result was that they couldn't compete. And when the Soviet Marshal announced, well, we need to have a scientific revolution to match everything else, I need another 15 or 20 percent of GNP for the military. Uh, the rest of the um, government figured out this just wasn't going to work, and the country spent 10 years of gloss-nosed openness, and then finally fell apart. If you look at your games, though, the fact you are the lunatic dictator of some star system and are investing all your resources in oh, warships or whatever has no negative consequences. <coughs> Also, despite the fact that independent actors, each of which understands his own, her, or her own business quite well, do much better than command economics because there's not the people in command just don't have the information to get things to work. Even though capitalism all uniformly, enormously beats socialism, that's not what you see in games. We are finally, of course, approaching the point, if I have a teraflop under my desk instead of a gigaflop, you could actually implement a legitimate economy. That hasn't been done. Okay, I've said a few words about economics and a few thoughts that you might think about for your own game design projects. And now we will go around and we will talk about graining. I've said a bit about it before. The notion of gra ingraining is that maybe you do not want to represent every single detail that is going on in a game. If we are discussing, we are the um, pioneers marching west with our Conestoga wagons to California, you probably do want to represent the fact that the grass has to sprout in the spring and it has to turn green before you have enough grazing to head west. You probably do not want in your game to represent every stand of trees between Missouri and California and the rule for how much they grow every week. I mean, you could do that, but it's an awful lot of those little meeple counters to keep track of. And most sensible people would not consider doing this. So there is a competition between coarse graining and fine graining. The other competition between coarse graining and fine graining is that if you break something into more parts, this is more true in a board game, there are more things that the player has to do to accomplish a turn. Now there are people who are really fond of having large amounts of detail. There are people who would really not like to have it. But you should realize there's an effect on the shape of the game. And someplace between, okay, we're going to do World War II. And here are the United Nations, America, Britain, the Soviet Union. And here is the axis 
Germany, Japan, Italy. I have left out a few minor details of geography rather clearly. I have coarse grained it as much as possible. And each side has a meeple. And first the German player attacks the UN player and rolls a die to see if anything happens. And then the UN player, who gets a few extra pieces first, attacks the Axis player and rolls a die to see what happens. And we've reduced all of World War II to one or two die rolls. This is very coarse grained. The geography is gone, the weapon systems are gone, all the details are gone, but this is the coarsest graining you can imagine. On the other hand, you can play it very quickly. And the rules can be very simple. So, what you can do is to say, okay, we have something like that, but maybe that's less detail than we want. Maybe we would like to break things down into more detail. And I will take two examples of games which I briefly mentioned before. And one is Credo, which I've mentioned before. And the other is Snit's Revenge, which was an old TSR, the people who first made D&D &D game. Snit's Revenge is fought out inside the body of one of the combatants between invading biological organisms and the creature's immune system. It's a Tom Wham game. He was a very clever, I don't know if he's still around, but very clever design, very simple, very amusing. But this is about as fine detail as you can get. Similarly, Credo, you are arguing about parts of a sentence. Well, not any sentence. The sentence in question is the Nicene Creed, which is the core of uh, Christian belief. The people researched in some details some of the alternative texts as to what Christians were supposed to believe. Uh, the one which always drew my attention, since it's very definitely not what made it in, I believe in one God, the living S-U-N, Son. That is, the divine being was incarnate, the body of light we see over there. That one did not make it in. And then there are some very complicated rules for theological disputation, imperial intervention, uh, recruiting supporters, it goes on a bit. Uh, but you're arguing about parts of a sentence. That's fine detail. Okay, so suppose we want to add detail. What can we do? Well, one, but I'm going to take an example from Dungeons and Dragons, which really started out as a set of miniatures rules, sort of. And the original rule set the original, it's in a plywood box, well, it looks like plywood, it's actually just paper, said we have three character classes. That's all, no more, no less, no need to discuss anything. We have a few additional species, though this is before Elvish Flummery was published. Um, and then one fine day, one of my friends, Peter Aronson, had the extremely ingenious idea, which he published in The Wild Hunt. And the idea was the specialist class, that yes, it is a magician, but it does some things very well at the penalty of doing other things poorly. This was the illusionist. And the notion of the illusionist was, it really is just a magician, except there are bonuses for certain sorts of spells. There are extra spells that only members of the subclass get. There are some types of spells the illusionist does quite poorly. And the notion is you can add these on top of another, each other. And because you can put things on top of each other um, this way, um, you get something that is more detailed and more interesting, you hope. On the same line, 
The alternative to subclass is, okay, well, no one says I can't invent a class either, and there was the fellow who invented the gentleman of independent means. This was an American war gamer. And the notion of the gentleman of independent means was, was an entirely different class based on how much money you had, as opposed to how many experience points you had. This was a bit different, too. Uh, similarly, you're saying, well, we have monsters, but you know, in the real world, biological organisms fit into an ecology. Some of them fit better than others. Um, if you are in Florida, you will discover that there were people who introduced the Burmese python. Burmese python get up to about 20 or 30 feet long. They're sort of competitive with the current top predator in the system, the alligator. Um, they are not necessarily quite as bright as alligators, but they'll eat anything under 50 or 100 pounds. Sooner or later, the Floridians are going to figure out this includes not only their large dogs, but their small children. Apparently, they haven't noticed that little issue yet. Um, in any event, you can say we have all of these monsters. They fit together ecologically. And if you decide, for example, to slaughter all the dragons, um, the things that the dragons ate are going to increase in numbers. That's a detail, but that requires intervention to do. Um, a third choice, which I will call implicit class, and this was realized, for example, in Champions, which was a design your own superhero, superhero game, is to say, we aren't going to say there are rigid classes or there are levels. Instead, you have some, a certain number of points, fairly large, three or four hundred, which you can invest in all sorts of superpowers and such not. Uh, it may be advantageous to put lots of points in a few powers rather than a few points in lots of powers. Uh, but the net result is the class distinctions faded off. There were good designs that sort of faked being classes, but they were implicit in the rules rather than being imposed from above. Oh, yes. And we are eventually going to the bottom to hit computer games. And the question is, how much detail and background do you want to supply? Now, in a board game, you can have a completely abstract game like chess. You can have theming that really doesn't have any particular function. Uh, on the other hand, you could do something like the original D&D, &D, where if you paid attention to the weapons, or if you knew Gary Gygax or Tim Cast or Greg Arneson per, uh, personally, you realized it was kind of medieval because there were sort of castles and there were spells and there were medieval type weapons like a cannon. Cannon faded from later rule sets. Um, but there was no real description of what the world was like. And you have to chug ahead a bit until several people had the ingenious idea, not only am I going to write my own game, so that I don't have problems with or letters from TSR's attorneys. So we'll have our own game with our own rules, and we can produce our own add-on products and get rich. But we're going to do it so we describe the world. And there were sort of three of these that started this out. One was Red Bear, White Moon, And one was Empire of the Petal Throne, which was very deep, worked out in enormous detail. There were a couple of novels out of it, too. And the third was City State of the Omnipotent Overlord. And in each of these, you had not only sets of rules for movement and combat and logistics and money and such not, but you actually had the background world spelled out in some detail. Now, what you did with the world was entirely up to the imagination of the games master. 
but there were, and the games did not come with, here is the challenge to deal with, but um, there was some framework in which you set things. So, for example, if you were an empire of the petal throne, um, you might not, might or might not realize that Xarul, the uh, doomed prince of the blue chamber, was about to be released. This is bad news for his opponents, to put it mildly. Uh, or at least was an option that you could write scenarios around, but the games master had to do the options. And we now push ahead a bit, because the next line down is what might be called the module. And the module, would, the simplest module, was here is a dungeon we have designed for you and you get to attack it. Uh, however, how you attacked it, what you brought to the attack, uh, how the folks inside behaved was all up to the games master. And while you now had a specific scenario to fight out, or talk your way through, or whatever, the um, play was entirely up to the games master, and it was fairly freeform. Uh, this occasionally led to interesting results, and there was an acquaintance of mine who noted having reached this place, and the people had thrown this huge number of high levels at the front door, and had 100% casualties without seriously injuring the doorkeeper, who was a relatively low level relative to what was inside. Um, and the friend of mine suggested to these people there was a thing called tactics. As opposed to you line up and one character at a time fights the villain. And after the first character is dead, it's time for the second character to fight the villain. Uh, after not very long, the games master was sitting there saying, not fair, not fair, uh, because his very impressive module was completely wiped out and all of these other things, and the people who were attacking it not only lost no people, they took no damage. That's tactics. However, it was free form. There was nothing saying you had to go through the front door rather than inspect carefully and notice the water came through here into the swimming pond, which was usually deserted at late at night, and all of the characters could hold their breaths long enough to get inside without anyone seeing them. It went downhill from there, and if they had more sophisticated spells, it went downhill very quickly. That's tactics, but this was a module. And finally we hit the object that basically resembles a mud worm, quite appropriately. We have a set of linked scenarios. Oh, I'm going to put one thing in first. The detailed problem. You have the isolated village, and no matter where you are, go, there are clues that the villagers are having problems, and you can wander around searching for more, and in the end you figure out what the problem is or the villain and solve things. But you could attack the problem from all different directions. This was even less uh, specific than that. No one said you had to loot the place rather than show up, smile, and have a nice party. But this one was detailed problem. And now we get to the object that does resemble the mud worm, which is a set of linear boxes. And you get to march through each linear box. This may start sound like many game scenarios. And there may be a couple of ways to get from one box to the other. Or there may only be one way to get from one to the other. But it was a linear um, march through, and you didn't have much choice about it. And some you had no choice at all. If you tried to sit there, you would be rendered unconscious and transported to the next <laughs> box, whether you liked it or not. At the extreme bottom are the people who insist not only we will have boxes, and they are in linear order, but each box is automatically terminated at this end by the largest obstacle. 
for which you can invent several names. I'm sure you can come up with some. And all of the boxes, if the modules are designed right, are exactly the same except for the fine details. And at some place down here, in terms of what the game leaves to the choice of the players, we have moved to from complete freedom of choice down to, uh, you could program the players to be played by the computer too, and then you could just sit back and watch and not have to wear out your arm using, hitting keys or moving the mouse around. Um, and so we have this devolution downhill all the way in terms of how much choice there is for the games master and the players, how much freedom there is as to what you do with the game. And down here, in a sense, there's almost, you could say, we have fine-grained the, the decision matrix so that there, is almost, there are almost no choices to be made. And up here, the decision matrix is you choose. You will realize that about here I've hit computer games. This is the other end. There is another end, and it's much more positive. Uh, some of the massively multiplayer games are really much more up here than they are down here. I suppose you could say that Second Life, except is it a game? Is there a competition? Second Life is up here. It's entirely up to the individual people what they do. Of course, they tend to end up with a world that's quite empty, but it's up to almost entirely under the control of the players. And down here we have the one-person shooters, don't we? Well, as Greg Kostikian said, there is a world beyond first-person shooters, and you should be trying to take advantage of it. So that is coarse and fine-graining in terms of game design. Um, another thing you can do for coarse and fine-graining comes up in terms of, well, how do you break down the um, pieces you have into subunits. And since you are not designing a military game, I'm going to talk about the military breakdown for land forces. For na ocean and air forces, things t stay much simpler. But for land forces, things are complex. And once upon a time, you had the army or host which approximately speaking was a mob of peasants with agricultural tools. And two hosts had at each other, and if we go back enough years, they're very small hosts and very small armies, but that is basically what warfare had become. Uh, if we advance to the Battle of Megiddo, which is one of the Egyptian pharaohs, who appears to have lost rather badly, but had very good historians writing his history for him, he broke his host into four parts, and he also had what appears to have been the Egyptian marines, who were actually the palace guard and trained and actually fought in some vague semblance of formation. But you would say we have this breakdown, and we break things down or build things up from pieces. Um, you don't have to use all the pieces. If we use this to represent the Egyptian army at Megiddo, the Egyptians have five unit counters. It's like playing chess and you only have five pieces. Uh, on the other hand, you can break things down all the way and you say, we're going to do this with toy soldiers and I will have a piece, a toy soldier for each person in the battle. Um, I am not aware of anyone who has done that with Megiddo. There were, however, the people who did the Battle of Borodino. And the Battle of Borodino had several hundred thousand people there, and they used one figure as about five people, so they had approximately 40,000 toy soldiers on the field. And they fought out the battle over several weeks. Now, the obvious question you ask is, where do you deploy 40,000 toy soldiers and terrain, and by the way, it has to be indoors because it will, over two weeks, you can count on heavy rains or the like. Were they um, just reenacting it, or were they like setting up the scenario as it was at the beginning and just... They are refighting the battle, and there was someone representing 
Napoleon and there was someone representing Kutasov and there were com several layers of commanders down to the people who were pushing the soldiers. So it wasn't going to exactly occur the same way it happened? That's right. No, this was a game okay. being fought out. And the answer is, you rent an airship hangar. There's one in <laughs> Lakewood, New Jersey. Okay, let us actually talk about how armies are broken up. And you should realize, at some point, you have the level that is all of the forces there. And at some smaller, at some finer scale, you have the level at which you will represent the forces on the board. Um, representation can be detailed. There are Star Trek games where, uh, gee, yeah, I have a starship and it has this damage sheet that's this big and I can shift energy around and it's very fine detailed inside each ship. This is fine if you have six spaceships. If you have one of the battles from Williams, Jack Williamson's 50s novels where you have 30,000 ships shooting at each other, you possibly do not want this, the players to have to handle this much detail for all 30,000 ships. Not if you expect them to finish. Okay, so we start out and there is a single person and you assemble them we're looking at the people who are actually shooting at each other, and you assemble them into groups of about four, which are called fire teams. And you assemble two to three of these that aren't all the same, and you have a squad. And that's about 10 to 12 people. Now you should realize different armies organize a bit differently. If you have been on the battlefield for a while, there are casualties and these units get much smaller. And so we have um, World War II, you have a tank division which should have 300 tanks and other things, and it's down to one vehicle because it's essentially lost all its vehicles. And then times about four, but not all the same type usually, you have a platoon. And times about four, but there may be special weapons units or the platoon that has the mortars and the heavy machine guns. You have a company. And about the same, mo this is about 200, give and take. And you repeat this times four, and you have a battalion. And there will be headquarters units and medical units and other things. And this might be about 1,000 people. And then you have a regiment. And you notice I'm being fairly consistent at times four, give or take. But you keep picking up all sorts of other things. You might pick up a bunch of, arti of, uh, of large artillery pieces. And this is about 4,000 people, give or take. And now we get up to the division. which is something like 10 or 18,000 people, depending on the country. We're now in the range where national organizations vary a lot. You may start to wonder, why is it called a division? What is being divided up? And the answer is the next thing, which was the core. And this was, in terms of how you do it, was Napoleon Bonaparte's great innovation. That is, what Bonaparte <coughs> said is, I have an army and it has infantry and guys on horseback and people pulling cannons around. And if I try to give orders to 100,000 men, it will be quite incoherent. So we have these smaller formations. And what I'm going to do is take my smaller formations and have a basic unit, which is an army in miniature. It has every, all of the parts that an army would have. It has infantry, it has cavalry, it has artillery, it has engineers who can build pontoon bridges and clear roads and such not. And it has a good someone in charge who can fight it and command it. And it can sit on a battlefield for a reasonable part of the day while the rest of my army comes up, assuming it runs into people. After all, we're in 1800. There is no air reconnaissance worth noting. There were balloons, a few of them. Uh, 
reconnaissance, the, you, the way you found the enemy was you sent out people on horseback and you had spies to report where the enemy might be going. And you tried to march at simple targets like the enemy capital city, so, because they'll tend to figure out where you are. And then you have some number of these two to eight <coughs> divisions in a corps, and some number of these, and now we get up to the army. And that was fine until World War II, and actually it was not true in World War I, but they weren't quite as organ didn't work out the organization then. And you have the army group or group of armies, which is really big, and you have in the Russian, though not in any one else, the front, which is a collection of these. And finally, you have the national force. Okay, so how do you use this in game design? Well, you notice we are going to have a battle on Tunisia 1941, and there were a fairly large core of Germans and something the same size of Americans and British on the two sides. And so that's what's there. That's decided the total size. Now, you could represent this with one meeple, German meeple and one American-British meeple, and roll the dice once to see who won, but you notice there's no tactics there. And then what you do is to say, we're going to take this and we're going to break it into pieces. And the smaller the pieces are, the more of them we get. And if we break them into these, there may be six pieces on the board. That's probably not too interesting. And if we go down to here, there may be um, six pieces on each side, 24, that's more plausible. And here we're in some place approaching 100, which is as large as many people want. But if you have real enthusiasts, you go down to here, and you have thousands. And you make the second decision, which is how you are going to break up whatever it is you're trying to represent into parts, and how much graining you use. Now, I happen to have talked about infantry, because I know there's some interest in war games and military stuff, because there's a lot of it in computers. But the fact that this happens to be an army organization is not central to what I am discussing. What is central is the notion that you can put in more detail or less detail. And if you have a spaceship and you know it's going to be damaged for whatever reasons, you may have a locker labeled parts. And depending on how much repair you need, you go through a certain number of boxes of parts. Those of you who have been stuck owning an automobile will have noticed, though, that parts are not interchangeable. And you might have outside parts and engine parts. And you can then go on into finer and finer details to how many types of parts you have and how you have to assemble them to repair the vehicle. And those of you who played Vanished Planet will notice you had all of these parts you needed to assemble, starting with basically raw materials. And you assembled all these, and you eventually got a mine or a whatever. And at the top end, you had something you assembled out of little things. Well, Vanished Planet did not have, give you, have you have thousands of tons, meaning thousands of little chits, worth of raw materials on the table at a time. Uh, however, the um, fine detail was still there, even though the number of pieces did not explode geometrically because you've broken things up down four levels. Okay, so what I have talked about a bit is the notion of fine graining and coarse graining. Um, a different sort of fine and coarse graining comes up in ownership. And um, There is an amusing game on bootlegging. And you're the fellow who, or gal who runs the still and ships the finished product to places where it's sold. But you can take interests, a small interest, large interest, dominant, controlling interest, in each of the speakeasies that sell it. The disadvantage of doing this is it costs a lot of money, and victory points are money. The advantage of doing this is that if you have a dominant interest, they will always sell your brand of 
distilled alcohol first and other people's later. Or they won't even let the other guy's trucks in the door. You see, we have broken, I own the plant into some, or the store rather, into something with much finer detail. And there's now a competitive element that you've added because there is fine detail. I am approximately out of time. I shall ask one, a couple of questions for hands. I'll edit this out of the tape if I remember to. Uh, how many of you have actually started game design in terms of what pattern of play you're going to use um, and such not? Hands? Hmm, well, some of you have and some of you haven't. Okay. I remind you, next Wednesday, we are going to do Conquest of the Fallen Lands. The Tuesday after that, there had better be something that at least fakes being a playing game if one of the designers is sitting there to explain obscure rules. Hopefully it will be more complete than Operation Gigantus, the play version was, in which a few things were missing like the air and naval rules for a, what was in fact a World War III game. Uh, there were a few little details left out. Do better than that. Class dismissed.